Say hi to Michael Moore. Thank you. Such a beautiful day out. What are you doing in here? <laughs> I'm going to drink some Fiji. Is that okay? Fiji is, I think Fiji is okay. Oh, okay. Again, it's just that sure. whether the container ship that brings it here is, is cool so the yeah. plastic doesn't leach. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> we're, we're waiting. <laughs> we're yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. get some tap water for you. <laughs> you know, in the last couple of days when we were doing uh, um, uh, the Q&A after the film, uh, you said uh, on a couple of occasions, you said, you know, we are directors first and foremost. We are filmmakers first and foremost. And one of the things that you said that really struck me was you were talking about the ending of Where to Invade Next, uh, you know, with the Berlin Wall, and you were saying, well, we just shot, and then we found that ending. But, you, kn you know, you said you can always tell when, you said, I don't do second takes. You know, I don't do like, you know, let's do that again so that it looks better or clearer or something like that. You know, w you can always tell. So it's just I just sort of wanted to start in that vein. Oh, okay. Um. Art is more important than politics. One hand. Wow, that so was a very tentative. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, they're processing it because Michael Moore just said that. So <laughs> I say it because um, if we as artists, as filmmakers, don't make a great film, one that people want to see and see again and tell other people to go see. If we've put the politics first, because this is an important issue and I must say this, ahead of the art, and the art suffers as a result, it's just another documentary that is either telling you things you already know or just preaching to the choir or just whatever, then, <laughs> then we have failed as political people by not putting the art first. It's, it's, it's so important, I say this, I, I, I mean I preach, I go to documentary classes, I tell the students, um, I know you're, if you make documentaries, you're making them probably about issues you care deeply about, I'm so happy that you do care deeply about them, but please, please ask the question, how, how is this going to work as a piece of cinema? How are we performing as artists here because if we do our job as artists, the message is going to get to so many people and be so effective in reaching them. If, if you, <coughs> I mean, I remember when I, when I first came here 26 years ago to this festival with Roger and me, and I was like, how do I tell people, because they're asking me all these questions, what are your favorite documentaries? And I didn't have a good answer because I hated documentaries. <laughs> and, and, um, I really, those of us who made Roger Me, we set out to make the anti-documentary. We set out to make a movie. I despise the word documentarian. I never use it. I ask journalists not to use it, unless they're gonna call Scorsese a fictionitarian, <laughs> or Ridley Scott a fictionitarian. Quit calling documentary filmmakers documentarians. We're filmmakers. The author of the Steve Jobs book, Walter Isaacson, is an author. We don't try to diminish him because he wrote nonfiction, unlike a real writer who can make up a story. <laughs> nor, but nor do we call the fiction writer a fiction whatever. We call that Fist. woman... A fictionist. We call that woman or man an author. And when documentary filmmakers make their films as films, the films, the documentaries, succeed. If they make it as documentarian, which means they're making medicine for you to, to eat or drink so that you uh, will get better and make the world better, then it isn't gonna work because we don't like to take medicine, especially when it tastes like castor oil. So that's an old reference. I don't know what's a younger, do young? We, our generation, we raise kids with all sugary, gooey, happy stuff and making sure that they don't fall down or eat dirt or bugs or whatever. So we're like hovered over them for so long that we don't have a castor oil that we gave our kids. But basically bad tasting medicine. And, and I, think <coughs> I think, I don't think Michael Barker or Tom Bernard would mind if I tell tales out of school, but I had this discussion whether they, they are the people that run, uh, along with Dylan, uh, so uh, Sony Pictures Classics, a wonderful, as you know, right, distributor. And we're having this discussion about how uh, Bowling for Columbine 
uh, kicked off a, a second wave of this modern day documentary. So you can, you, if, you, if, you, if you start with Roger and me, I'm sorry that I make both these references mine, but I, they just, I'm, I'm just stating facts. Before Roger and me, in the history of cinema, there were nine documentaries that grossed a million dollars or more. That's it, nine. After Roger and me, there have been 129. So that, you can mark the date there. Um, and then it sort of, it tapered off and then exploded with Bowling for Columbine. And then after, and then, and then right away, Fahrenheit 9-11, which, you know, um, broke Return of the Jedi's opening weekend record. They had held the record for the largest opening gross of any movie ever uh, under, I think, 1,000 or 900 screens. So it broke that record and still holds the record for documentary box office and also the largest grossing um, Palm d'Or winner. So that includes so that includes Apocalypse Now, Pulp Fiction, et cetera, et cetera. And after that, boom, Inconvenient Truth, Super Size Me, uh, Spellbound, uh, right? You remember this uh, wave of great like cinematic document things you wanted to see in a movie theater with 200 other people, right? And it, there was this great wave, and then and then this is where Barker and Bernard pick up <laughs> that then all the distributors, especially the small distributors, decided every, we, have, we need more documentaries, buy documentaries. And documentaries that were made for television, which are great documentaries, and I had two television documentary series uh, with The Awful Truth and TV Nation, so I'm not opposed to TV. But documentaries that play well on HBO, that play well on POV, independent lens, should not be in movie theaters. They're, they're two different, you're making them for two different audiences. Those of us who make them for movie theaters, first of all, have this in mind, a huge friggin' screen. I mean, this isn't huge, but for this theater, it's, it's huge. Big enough. Right? It's a beautiful, I, I love what you guys have done <laughs> with the whole place here. It's so. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> can we come back to that? I want to say yeah, something sure. about your film center. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, I'll make a note of that. <laughs> well, I am an exhibitor. So I run and program three theaters in Michigan uh, that are all nonprofits. Is it year-round in Traverse City? Absolutely, year-round, 365 days of the year, yes. And um, we've, we've been open for about uh, almost 400 weeks now, and, and for 90 of those weeks, uh, we've been in the top 10 grossing theaters in the country, in all of North America, for the film that was showing there that week. Um, and it's a town of 14,000 people. And when you look at the box office grosses for the week, it shows Lincoln Plaza, Sunset Five, Traverse City, State Theater, uh, <laughs> Coolidge Corner, <laughs> East Street Landmark in DC, uh, Embarcadero Center. Um, uh, so it's kind of a cool list to see a town of 14,000 cities of millions. But I, I, can, I, just, I don't, I don't want to get off the subject, I'm sorry about that. But I, I, I feel so strongly as a filmmaker that we're the only art form that has no say over how our art is exhibited. Yeah. We're the only artists that do this. If I was a painter or sculptor, or if I was having a show down in Chelsea, uh, I would, I pick the frames. Yeah. I set the lights, you know, I <laughs> now realize I can't go to 3,000 theaters and do that, but at the very least, there's no quality control. And all you have to do, if you're a filmmaker, go watch your film at the Parama 6. And think about all the time and effort you put into your art, watching it being butchered by a really bad theater, bad sound system, bad screen. Well, we're, th we're in, in uh, most multiplexes, the projectionist is just like one guy pressing a bunch of buttons. And, and popping the corn. Yeah, popping the corn, that's right. And they don't replace the bulbs, so you know you get a very dim image that's very common or and they f sometimes forget to change from the 3d yeah. uh, lens to the regular one yeah it's just awful yeah. it's just awful so it's like even a rock band that's completely stoned <laughs> will show up at five o'clock for the sound check because they care if you can hear it we put our film at the end of the mix in a DHL bag gone and then have no say over how it's shown to the people it's 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 
it will it is my 2016 crusade as a member of the directors guild to to, to have us I want the directors guild to have like a good housekeeping stamp where we will certify theater so in your town if you live in Seattle or Portland Boise whatever has the if you see the DGA insignia on that that means we as the filmmakers can tell you you're going to have a great cinematic experience in this theater uh, that's my I haven't said that publicly so I <laughs> But I care deeply about this, and I've constructed these theaters in Michigan. Are, you know, the MPAA last year listed us, they, list, they, they wrote this story on their website of the 10 best theaters in the world, and number one was the State Theater of Traverse City, Michigan. It's, I, can't, I, I can't say enough about what, if you ever are in northern Michigan, which you won't be, <laughs> but if you stop into my theater, you'll be transported back to the 1940s, I've, it's all built, re so it's a 100-year-old movie palace that had been shut down for years and dilapidated. And I completely, re I put it back into the 1940s. How many seats? 600 seats. Uh, there was no balcony, it had been twinned. It was just awful. I put the balcony back in. I have an organ that rises out of the stage that plays before the movie. Um, um, it's, uh, the, the seats are the most comfortable seats that you can imagine in to watch a movie in. Um, w when I went to, to pick out the seats, because I had to, you know, pick them out, I was, actually, I was, I was going to be on Oprah, and um, they had sent a plane for me, because I was up the lake in Traverse City, so she's in Chicago. So they sent a plane for me to come on to be on the show, and I said, hey, could the plane come, like, r early in the morning, and would you mind if I brought, if, could we stop in Grand Rapids on the way? Because Grand Rapids is the theater seating capital of the world, okay? It's like four companies that make all the theater seats, except for the Italian ones that you're sitting in. Well, that's an Alice Tully. You can tell? Well, Alice Tully, yeah, they're yeah. Italian. No, but you can yeah. look at the seats. Well, I, I can tell by I can't fit into them very well. Okay. You know, for one thing, they're made for Italians who oh, eat healthy and, and, they have, and, and they have long vacations. Move yeah. around and have a lot of vacation and, and an enormous amount of sex, so. <laughs> Isn't there a company down in South America, though, that makes theater seats, too? Oh, no, it's a company in China. In fact, right. one of the companies in Grand Rapids, I think, makes some of their stuff in China, but then puts the American label on it. But I, so we went down, so I, <clears throat> I got some people I know in Traverse City on this Oprah day. I got a pregnant woman, I got a short person, I got a tall person, I got a guy with a bad back, um, and me, and we all got on this private jet, flew to Grand Rapids, and <laughs> went to, I went to all four <laughs> theater to sit in them, and, th and the short person would sit behind yeah. the, and the pregnant woman would try to get out of the chair, and the guy with the bad back would see if he'd complain at all. And, um, <laughs> and we, got, we came to the, the last one, and they were like the, not the big fame. Like, you've heard of American seating, Irwin seating. This is all there. So um, we sit in these seats, and we're like, oh, my God, this is so comfortable. What is this? And it's a family-owned company. And he said, uh, it's the, uh, well, I licensed the 79 Mustang seat from Ford. It's the most comfortable car bucket seat. For real? Yeah, be, he says. Well, think about it. When they make a, a really, when they when they used to make a really good car seat, you may drive in that car for ten and twelve hours on a trip. Right. You can't sit in a theater seat for you know. It, so so for two hours you're going to sit in an er, er, ergonomically you know. But but it's all it's not it doesn't look like car seats in the movie theater. It's all plush red velvet. It's he turned it into a theater seat with a cup holder, yeah. and it is the most comfortable seat uh, uh, to, to sit in and it was a hundred dollars less than the other seats and I said huh okay how does the best seat become a hundred dollars less he said because all our parts and all the thing is made in Michigan I said you're kidding he says every bolt every screw the, the, le the leather the this all done in Michigan I said oh my god then again I have to say how do you do this for a hundred dollars seat less and he said well um, I just I like the if you did you see my film the, the Italian the clothing people about getting richer. He says, I already have one or two vacation homes. I don't need five. So I can, I can undercut them price-wise because I'm wealthy and happy and I don't need to be wealthier. I was like, wow. And um, so we bought our seats there. And uh, I've, I've, the seats are in so many theaters around the country because I've told this story so much. <laughs> I'd get no commission for it. But I, because I just want you to be enjoyed and you know enjoy sitting in the th theater and not have somebody's head. I'm against stadium seating. Stadium seating for f we hate it. Filmmakers hate it. 
because the high back, especially for a comedy, muffles the laughter in the theater. So or your laugh goes right into the hard back and doesn't go. You need In a comedy, you need the contagious nature of laughter in the theater. It isolates the person. You're sitting in these like booths almost. You know, you need to see other heads. You need to, see, you need to this is a communal thing. This, it's not the movies unless it's a group of people and you're sitting there with strangers in the dark. Yeah. It's not a movie. Watching Lawrence of Arabia on your iPhone, I don't know what that's called, <laughs> but you're not watching Lawrence of Arabia. I, I don't have a name for it yet, but I'm just, you know, post office issues the Mona Lisa stamp. Okay, yes, that's the Mona Lisa, but that's not the Mona Lisa. It's a stamp of the Mona Lisa. We wouldn't call that the Mona Lisa. So, so anyway, so I believe in huge screens, comfortable seats, great sound. And audiences. And audiences, and I, when we pack them in uh, every week, they're, they're watching Meet the Patels today. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll be one of the highest grossing theaters in the country this week for that film. And, um, and, and one rule, one, uh, you know, popcorn is $2, pop is, I mean, soda yeah. is $2. Um, candy's a dollar. Yeah. You can get it, a, you know, so families can come. Right. There's no ticket higher than 850 uh, if you're if you're a member, which is really cheap to be a member. It's uh, six bucks to yeah. watch a movie there on a Friday night. What's the one rule though? The one rule is if we catch you on your cell phone <laughs> or texting, or if that glowing screen comes on in any way, shape, or form, yeah. you are banned from the theater for life. There you go. Life. You show that 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 Alamo Draft House. Uh, no, I came trailer. up with the idea. Okay. He they stole. It, he stole it from okay, me. Okay. Yeah. Let it be known. No, 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 no. And and in fact, I've been. Tr we, it, we are so. And because we're northern Michiganders, so we're close to Canada, so it's like a very polite area, you know. So people actually obey the rule. And um, um, but the um, <laughs> I've been, we've been wanting to catch somebody because I want to make a PSA to run before the movies. <laughs> what I'm going to say to the first person we catch. You know, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rescind the ban, but you're going to have to play a, the role in the PSA. And then we're going to reenact dragging him out of the theater, <laughs> out into the middle of Main Street with a, with a Joan of Arc uh, post and tie him to it and light him on fire. Yeah. The last part will be special effects. <laughs> but, uh, but, <laughs> but it's ruined the movie-going experience. Yeah, and especially yeah. anybody over the age of 40 or 45 Man, the crowds have really dropped going to the movies, and, and and I got them to come back because nobody likes to go to a movie on a Friday or Saturday night anymore because of the way the kids have, and they've got arcades in the lobby and everything. Yeah. What was I in the middle of talking about when I got off on this? No, we were set? talking about being you were talking about being a filmmaker, and I mean, the, actually, something else that you had said is that you used to bring the theater seat with you. Right. Right. Yes, because we used to carry a rickety theater seat in the back of the crew van to remind you that to remind all of us that the audience is a yeah. member of our crew. Right. That this my film isn't finished till you leave, and do something. So you're part of this. I'm not doing this for you. Um, people keep asking me, "Oh, you haven't made a film in six years. Why has it been six years?" Well, again, I just think, well, they haven't seen, they didn't see my last film. At the end of Capitalism, a love story, I said, "I'm tired. I'm tired of being the poster boy for Fox News. I'm tired of being, you know, uh, <laughs> constantly in need of security." Uh, I, I long for death threats because uh, one thing I've learned from the security guys is that once they get it out in the threat, they don't do any. The, the person that's going to hurt you does not issue a death threat. They cathartically get it out through the angry email they send you. So you, you want the death threats. Uh, what you don't want is the actual attempt. Right, you don't want the death. Yeah. So after six attempts on my life with various weapons, and then the final one being the guy that built the fertilizer bomb, you probably know the story, and was going to put it under our house, and then his AK-47 accidentally went off, and some neighbor heard it, called the cops, and he was arrested, and he went to prison. Uh, you didn't hear about this? Yeah, why not? <laughs> it's kind of odd, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, because but the security people thought the more we keep this quiet. I mean, he had, there was a trial. You can look it up in the Chicago papers. He was he was from uh, Illinois, and uh, and so he went to he went to prison. And um, but that was kind of that sort of kind of totally fucked up our lives uh, in a profound uh, way. Because then I had to have these guys living with us twenty four seven, and uh, so it was a rotten way to live. 
I didn't want to keep doing this uh, if uh, if people weren't going to rise up and do something about all this stuff. I'm not going to be the only one out there. I'm not the only one out there. I know I'm not the only one. The, a month before the Iraq War, there were a million of us on the street here in New York and across the country. I mean, there were largest demonstrations in the history of the country. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, I because I have access to media, and I have this the bully pulpit, so to speak. But at that time, to be alone out there. With, and I didn't mean to go off on David Remnick and David uh, and Bill Keller, but the liberal establishment in this town. Everybody got in line and you know, got in line the and supported the war. The New Yorker, the New York Times, Al Franken, 29 U.S. Democratic senators. Um, I would turn on shows and I'd hear liberals berate me for the Oscar speech. You know, um, I remember actually on that night turning the TV on back in the hotel room in LA and watching all the, all the, uh, you know, they have local shows after the, um, as I told you the other day, the local shows after the Oscars because it's only nine o'clock out there. So they have a, like a post Super Bowl wrap up with all the local commentators. And I just kept flipping the dial. Well, that's the end of Michael Moore. Well, that's the last we'll hear of him. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? He got a big standing ovation like five seconds earlier. Why would he do that? So, you know, I actually, I believed them. I thought I was over. I mean, I was really, uh, I was shunned and, and we, uh, we had a, uh, I had already had the deal signed and the first check cashed for my next film. And, um, and they called my agent uh, the next week and said, we're done, we're out. We don't want any part of him. And, um, and then everything went so well in Iraq, so, you know. <laughs> It, it doesn't help the world that I was right. We now are fucked. And this whole refugee crisis, crisis, not a crisis, it was manufactured by the United States of America. We went into the Middle East, pulled out, ripped out the infrastructure, literal infrastructure, political infrastructure, religious infrastructure that was somehow holding it all together, for better or worse, none of our business only to the extent that we should always be supportive of any group of people trying to find their freedom. But other than that, you know, and we created this thing and then we're like, no, we'll take 5,000 refugees. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You know, does anybody feel any shame? I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, anyways. I, but I was saying something about being a director. Well, I <laughs> I also d I want to interject that we're showing a film that in, in the coming days called Homeland Iraq Year Zero, and I really urge everybody to check it out. Um, it's a movie made um, right before the invasion and right after the invasion. It's a pretty devastating experience, but it's an amazing film. Yeah, it's um, in in uh, Fahrenheit 9/11. The two producers of this film, of my film here, um, are people I've worked with for a couple of decades, and they made their own film. Were nominated for the Oscars. Uh, called Trouble the Water about Katrina. Remember this a few years ago? Beautiful film. They're sitting right over here. Carl Deal and Tia Lesson. And uh, <laughs> they um, uh, they offered to go uh, to Iraq the month before the bombs were dropping to grab the footage. They got the footage that's in Fahrenheit 9-11 because uh, I wanted to do essentially what he apparently does beautifully, show the Iraq that's about to be destroyed. And, and I don't know if you remember all the hits I took for that, for showing the kids flying kites and the wedding ceremony and the happy life and how could he? They were living under a brutal dictator, Saddam Hussein, and look at him just showing like life is just, you know, why he's like that Nazi filmmaker who, you know, was brought in to show how they're treating your, the Jews really nice in this village. Your fellow filmmaker, Lenny Riefenstahl. Yeah. Well, uh, that was... Uh, no, not, no, not Lenny Riefenstahl. You're talking that, about... That, uh, Al Mazel's compared me to him, to, to her, I mean, to Lenny Riefenstahl. Really? You know, yeah. Yeah, but that's, I shouldn't say that on this day. I'm sorry. Um, he's a wonderful person and, and means a lot to all of us as documentary filmmakers. But the old school of documentary filmmakers, listen, they heard me say at the beginning on this stage that I didn't like documentaries and I was making the anti-documentary. Mm -hmm. And the old school thought, okay, fuck you. And they made sure that Roger Mee wasn't even nominated that year. Mm -hmm. And, and... I was not allowed into the academy for 13 years. I couldn't even vote, mm -hmm. you know. And then, and then finally, after bowling for Columbine, you know, then they, well, how could they not let me in? So, 
then I was let in and then I've made it my mission ever since to democratize the branch and to and to not have seven people picking these films yeah. for the Oscars. And so I I worked hard for years on getting the policy change and now all the whole branch votes. We used to have three years ago, four years ago we had zero African Americans, zero in the documentary branch. And I pushed against this. Now it's I think there's thirteen. There were 140 members. Now there's almost 300. Um, there's, it's more diverse. We have more foreign members. I think it's almost parity now. With I, I'm guessing, I'm pretty sure it is with women and men. Um, but this is like me banging my head against the wall and upsetting the old guard, and um, uh, who believe that documentaries shouldn't be subjective. They should be objective, and they should be, you know, we're just a fly on the wall. Mm. And I always thought that was the biggest lie because the edit room is the, is the cathedral of subjectivity. What you choose to put in the film is a subjective Where decision. Where yeah. you interpret it. How you interpret yeah. it. Mm -hmm. The story you're gonna tell, it's completely subjective. We are human beings. We are subjective beings. Mm -hmm. If by what you mean objective is the facts, yes. Mm. As you can have the most subjective film, but your facts had better be correct. If you say the sun rises in the east, it should rise in the east. Mm -hmm. The facts have to be absolutely correct. And I was telling you the story there backstage about, I mean, we hire, you know, people that used, to, you know, ex-New Yorker fact checkers to, I, I have them there's a, come in and rip the film apart. I want them to find something wrong. I don't put things in the film that, that I'm not absolutely certain are correct. You know, I'm sitting there in the, your theater here watching people go, no way. <laughs> you know, it's like, you've got to be kidding me, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Country after country, if you've seen the film. So I, every film I put up on the website for the film, and this will be up on the website, our fact Bible. Mm -hmm. And every fact I state in the film, I, I source it, and you can read the stories. Uh, so you don't have to even take my word for it if you don't want to. You can, uh, everything is... What part of the movie are they reacting to when they say that? Oh, the French... The, the, the lamb skewers <laughs> over couscous for right. third graders. Right. I mean, right. pff, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, that, that they have that many weeks paid vacation. But a lot of it was the stuff, though, that we were surprised. I didn't know that Portugal hasn't re arrested a single person for using drugs in 15 years. Did yeah. you know that? No. I didn't know that. Did you know that Austria, you can vote at 16 now and a half a dozen other countries? I didn't know that. Uh, you know, it was, it was, it was a, a number of things. That prison, I filmed that prison, everything in the film I shot this last year, but I shot it first, the, the prison in Norway, mm -hmm in 2006 for sicko because we were over there to show their healthcare system oh okay yeah. and and one of the things about the norwegian healthcare the nor the government of norway owns a like a, a huge spa in the canary islands and like with the germans you can get your doctor to write a prescription for a free two weeks or three weeks at this spa in the canary islands and i just thought if we put this in the film no one is going to believe this yeah. we're not going to believe this prison or, or i interviewed the f the the government philosopher <laughs> the, the the Norway Norway, Norway owns their oil. They don't allow Exxon and Shell to own the oil. They can license it, but they can't own it. The people own the oil in Norway, and then the, so then the money goes into the people, to the schools and everything, the roads. <laughs> uh, we had actually when we were filming this movie all across Europe, we were like, we had a bet going that the first the first person to spot a pothole got a hundred dollars, <laughs> hundred and fifty. If you saw a, a a tire on the side of the road, you know, and we like we, right, we just never hit a pothole. It was the <laughs> it was so weird, but because um, we're just not used to it, you know. The, the idea of a pothole over there is just like, and that was even in countries that not as wealthy as Germany. But um, uh, anyway, so you were talking about uh, you know insisting, and this is something that's really borne out in the film that you're optimistic and that um, you know there's there's a been a certain tendency on the left to be not optimistic and to kind of like you know um, uh, say okay everything's fucked you know well it, it then right. absolves us from doing anything right the, the, exactly. to feel powerless hopeless just to say they're all crooks yeah um, always and, yeah. right and, and or there was the sort of liberal faux intellectual version of it very prevalent in this town, I'm sad to say. Of, of well, the, Michael, the issue is much more complicated than that. 
uh, I don't think you've really explored exactly what this all means. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just like, dude, you know, you really should take the stick out of your ass. And, <laughs> you know, sometimes it is as simple as waking up in the morning and say, oh, let Mandel out of prison. Yeah. We don't need to keep him there anymore. Come on. Just just do it. Just do it. You know, it's, it's kind of... Um, some things aren't complicated. Well, when you keep racking up all the things that make it impossible, all the things that make and it difficult, all the things. Yes, and people keep, they come up with this list of why this can't happen or that can't happen. Or, you know, did you know that Italy has 12% unemployment? You know, it's like, what's your point? Yeah. You know, we have a lot of good ideas in this country. Should nobody emulate them because we've had 45 school shootings this year? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine somebody in Germany going, let's not do that American idea because they've had 45 school shootings this year. Mm. Well, what's... There are ones at Apple and ones in Orange, you know? It, it's like, but I know I'm going to have to kind of, you know, listen to that a little bit right. because everybody's yeah. smarter than the average bear. Right. And, uh, right. you know, and and I think one thing that also gets lost with me is is to, um, is it sh it, you shouldn't forget that I, uh, I come from the Midwest. Um, uh, and I come from a working class family. Mm -hmm. And I have a high school education and about a year and a half of college. So my, the invisible audience in my head when I'm making the film mm. isn't the Upper West Side where I have an apartment and live much of the year, especially when I'm working here. It's the apartment I have in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's the audience I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of the audience in my theater of Midwesterners, of working class people, of people who have a hard scrabble existence, who Michigan is not a pleasant place. Michigan never recovered. You know, it's a it's an awful, sad place. Um, you know, I'm sure you've seen the stories on Detroit. You've seen what Detroit looks like. Um, Beirut looks better than Detroit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, oh, I hope I didn't offend Beirut. <laughs> Some <laughs> Lebanese are beautiful people. Um, <laughs> But it's sad. It's just uh, it's just sad. And so, but I'm not I'm not really thinking of of the audience in this hood, where I live half the time. I'm thinking of that other audience, and and I'm approaching it from a, you know, the son of a union member um, who was grateful to be able to go to the dentist because we had benefits and it didn't cost anything. And uh, the mid the, well, I mean, the Midwest has a proud. That's a proud political history. I mean, for anyone who cares to study it and go right. back, that's progressive politics. That's where abolitionism yes. flourished. Yeah. Yes, right. It's not all whatever people think that it is. I don't know what it, what that means. But when I think when I put in the film, nobody nobody had heard that before. That Michigan was the first English speaking government in the entire world to eliminate the death penalty in 1848. Um, but that's you know. A lot of a lot of what that uh, upper New York and Michigan, there's a lot of migration in between the Syracuse, Buffalo, Rochester area, and into Michigan, and um, and uh, so a lot of the early suffragette stuff, a lot of the you know abolitionists, strong abolitionists, uh, started there with with uh, with Michigan, and I love that Dylan line. Um, um, I'm probably not going to say it right, but. The uh, the country I come from, uh, with God on our side. With yeah, the country I come from is called the Midwest. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right. And he comes from there, and so do the Cohen brothers. Yep. And Al Franken, who has apologized for supporting the war in Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, and 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 to just to elaborate on that theme, this is something that we were discussing the other night about. Uh, Obama, that you know, when he turned out in the beginning, you know, to be not exactly what everybody wanted, and they all abandoned him. You know, some people complained about him, you know, rightfully about you know certain decisions mm -hmm. that he made. But you, you, know, you, yeah, but you never abandoned him. You never just no, said, well, you know, God, no, he's a tool I mean, of the system. But believe me, a lot of people have. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, um, yeah, but you could say the same thing about me. I had a show on NBC mm -hmm. that was owned by General Electric at the time, so I guess I was a tool of the system. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's again, that's faux, faux intellectualism. Right. The person likes to sit back with their cynicism so yeah. they don't have to do anything, mm -hmm. you know. Um, y you know, uh, but when I do that, when I, when I don't participate, I don't, 
I don't recycle. Because I know what recycling is. I know what these blue cans are. It's a way to assuage uh, guilt and conscience, and I've done my part. Oh, look at me. I recycle. Really? I did, so when I had my TV show, we, I, 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 we followed the recycling trucks. This is back, this is back in the 90s. And of course, they just went, one time, one, one of the shows, it went right to the dump. You know, they just took the dump. Another one, it went on a barge or a ship, actually. We transport a lot of our plastic bottles to India and other places where it's recycled, um, where they work in these horrible working conditions. But, but, but when you're living, you know, on the, you know, 25th floor of your Upper East Side, <laughs> whatever, and you got your nice blue and green and yellow cans, you know, it makes you feel like you're doing something. And, and I don't want that feeling. I don't want that feeling that I've done my part because I did this. I'm not, don't stop recycling. It, we should, <laughs> I'm just saying it's for my own, my own head. I want to, I want to know that we're, that the planet, we are, the planet isn't fucked. The planet's going to be fine. Everybody, the planet's going to die. You know, the earth is dying. The earth is never going to die until that moment when it's supposed to explode. <laughs> That's, <laughs> that's when it dies. No, the, we're, we're the ones. That, the plant's going to take care of us. The plant is going to remove us like it has removed other things that it didn't like. And it will remove us <laughs> for our treatment of the planet. But, you know, so... Um, but as a director... <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I don't drink coffee, too. I just... Uh, you keep apologizing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Let's open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, where's the, yeah, right up there. And the mic, yeah. Uh, I saw your film yesterday and I, I loved it. Um, and what it kind of reinforced for me is that we do live in a bubble in America. And I didn't know most of the things that you were telling me. And I was sitting next to someone who I dragged to this movie. And I was telling someone yesterday, or today, on the Upper West Side, a woman, and I said, you have to go see this film. It'll blow your mind about what is going on outside of America. And, and she said, who is it? And I said, your name. And she said, oh, I hate him. And, and I said, why? And she said, well, he's always trying to be so funny about this stuff. And I was, I was, what I was really trying to do was exactly what you were saying. I was like, I saw this film that I want to share with you, but because of your whatever, you're not going to allow me to share that, and you're probably not going to even give the film a chance. And it was just kind of amazing to me because it was literally kind of reinforced what I got from your film was that there's this other way that we could be living, and, and we could all be making a difference if we were kind of more aware of what's going on outside of America. And, and I, I don't get that from the television or the media, and I have to go searching for it. So it's not really a question. It was more of something I just wanted to, to share with you. Well, and this was an Upper West Side woman? That oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and her son is a film student at AFI. Uh -huh. and, um, and what does she do? I have no idea. I don't think she does anything. Uh, she just was so dismissive of, of me. And then she started talking about all the bad films that she goes and sees whenever she goes to a film festival. So I kind of ended the conversation. And strangely enough, this was at a cold-pressed juice bar where you're supposed to have more enlightened conversations. But, but it, it was just indicative of, of a kind of attitude that I'm from New York. I live in Los Angeles right now. And I love coming back to New York. But I do find that there is a certain kind of liberal intellectualism that I was raised amongst that is very dismissive of anything that sees um, hope and, and optimism for our future as a country. Right. It's, yeah, well, to her credit, though, and to the Upper West Side liberal intellectuals, I mean, they have lived through a lot. Yeah, we, yeah. we have not had many victories in our lifetime. Yeah, yeah. None of us ever would expect, ex in 2006, if any of us had said that a guy whose middle name was Hussein would be the president of the United States in two years, yeah. they would have thought we were nuts. Yeah, yeah. So to, I mean, to understand their, their frustration is built up over the years. Yeah, um, I, I, I didn't condemn her 
I just wanted to kind of break through that. Well, and I would like to condemn her. Um, <laughs> now that I've said that. All right. First of all, her loathing of me is a second only to my own for myself. So <laughs> that's number one. Yeah. <laughs> so whatever she said is no worse than what I'm thinking about me in my head for yeah. a good part of the day. Right. Secondly, it is a class thing. Kids from Flint don't go to the AFI film school. Yeah. So we from the middle from the middle class, the working class, um, you know, if you're African American, sometimes it's the made the comment is made if you're a woman. Um it uh you know the code. So you get it. We also know that our sense of humor, especially from the Irish working class that I grew up in, is is very prevalent. It's dark. It has to be dark. It's pretty dark <laughs> existence. <laughs> it's that or drinking, and you know. So I chose the r humor route. Some of our best are though are both are drinkers and humorists. <laughs> um, but. Um, yeah, I think that that's just, I think that um, that's okay. I use humor because I want to reach people. Noam Chomsky doesn't use humor because Noam's speaking to us. And so we read Noam and we need Noam, but Noam isn't going to play at the Parama 6. That's my job. Noam does his job, I do my job. My job is to reach the masses. And I'm one of the few people on the left who have crossed over into the mainstream and into middle America with tens of millions of people going to my movies. Um, I love the film forum, I go to the film forum, but I'm not the film forum. And that's okay, we need the film forum. Please support the film forum. But that's, that's not my job. My job is to reach people and humor is the best way to reach them. And if you don't believe that, ask Groucho, Mark Twain, Richard Pryor, Lenny Bruce, uh, George Carlin, these are all pretty angry people. They were all pretty angry at the social condition. And, um, um, and they were brilliant. They understood that humor was, was the vehicle to hop on to reach the people. And you need to laugh while you're showing people some awful stuff. And, and for her to say that I'm just you know, making fun of the stuff or being too funny or being the class clown or whatever, I take that as a compliment because yeah. You know, that's, I've believed from the beginning, and I try to encourage other documentary filmmakers to use humor um, because, because, oh, I know they're, they're over here, they're sitting over, my friends are sitting here thinking, don't say what you're going to say, but, you know, you just, what we do with that theater seat in the van or what we say to ourselves, because how do people go to the movies? Honey, let's go to the movies tonight. What do you want to go to? Oh, how about if we go to that movie on, no, fill in the blank. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't say it, right? Don't say it, okay. <laughs> fill in the blank of, of pe wonderful issues of doc you could, that documentaries are made on that people don't go to. Watch them on TV, yes. Definitely, in the home, yes. Mm -hmm but you've worked all week. If you come from the working class, you think I've worked my ass off all week. I'm going to the movies. It's the only thing I can afford. I can't afford the $175 ticket to the Detroit Pistons. The, the bleacher seats to see the Tigers are you know, 60 bucks. Uh, to go to the U2 concert was $280. But to go to the movies, from my theater, it's six bucks to any place outside of this island, you can still see a movie for 10 bucks. It's the only entertainment left for the working people of this country, the working poor and the poor. It's the only thing, if you wanna go out on a date, if you wanna start a relationship with somebody, you can't even go to friggin' dinner unless it's at Popeye's. Dinner for two is gonna cost you at least 40 bucks. Dinner, movie for two can go for 10 or less. So I honor that, and I respect that, and I know that that's where the change is gonna occur, not on the Upper West Side of New York. In fact, with no offense, those of us from Michigan and the other places, while we greatly admire everything about this city, and I love this city very much, 
um, you know, in the end, we went down the toilet and there was no hand there to pull us out. And the liberal or the Democratic Party way of doing things didn't save us. So we realized a long time ago that the Calvary wasn't coming. All over the country. <laughs> yeah, Calvary not just Michigan. Come. That's right. They're not coming. So you got to pull yourself out of this. The other lesson is don't talk about movies at a cold press juice bar. Right. That I what? Oh, I had a cold press juice yeah. bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but isn't there also the question, Michael, of like, you know, there's uh, when I when I was young, there was a whole a anybody who tried to be inspiring. the The idea of a hero was um, uh, anathema. People just didn't want, you know, the uh, the, the heroic was no good. Um, there was no, mo there was supposed to be no such thing as inspiration. But you, you know, that's if you're going to throw that out, then. What he built from nothing, but I, I, and my role—I don't see my role as the hero. Of this, but I—but I do, and we talk but about. You're this. trying to inspire people. Oh, I'm trying. Yes, and more. I want. I'm your stand-in. You know, you're not going to maybe get to the into that corporate headquarters, or you're not going to be able to go. But I'm going to go there, and I want you. If I do the movie right, I want you to cathartically feel that you're there, and that you're going, and that you're like, yeah. You know, I want, I, once, if I do my job, that connection is made with the individual audience member where they realize I'm just there in their place. I'm not the person that's going to fix it. I'm not the hero, but I am you because you have the same feelings and you think it's, you think that the crap we're feeding our kids in school is wrong. I know you do. And I think you think it's wrong that we have created a prison industrial complex that is incarcerating the African American population to the extent that in a state like Florida, one out of three black men can't vote. Not the men in prison. Black men, one out of three, have been removed from the voting rolls. It's the only way Republicans could have gotten elected in these years is by, it's through this incarceration process. Don't worry, there wasn't a want to see conference. Nobody sat around a table and said, hey, I got a good idea on how we can keep those blacks from voting. You know? But... It, it was an unintended wonderful consequence for white racist America. And um, gerrymandering on the other hand, that's something else. <laughs> yeah, and gerrymandering rigs the card game. That, that helps, those two things together have, have really helped. I'm sorry to keep talking so much. Yes. Uh, more, um, I wanted to spend time if you did. Uh, can you hold on here? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Moore, I wanted to ask you, you said the time you spent about a couple years from your most previous film to now. Uh, talk about what the pros and cons of that. What it was it like you know, taking your time making this film, you know, the process? The, the time, oh, I, 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 I didn't, the six years in between capitalism and Lewis Arnett, I didn't, I didn't make the film over six years. Uh, yeah, it was made over the last year. Um, and you were going through a tough time during those years, you were saying? Yeah, yeah. My dad died uh, a year and a half ago. I got divorced last year. So I'm just like everybody else. Everybody's, we all go through these moments in life, right? You need to kind of take a moment, take a breath. And, but actually I, I came out of that, not depressed, but kind of liberated in the sense of, of thinking life was good <laughs> and let's live life. And that's what my dad, you know, that's what my dad lived. That's how he taught me. And I think he'd be bummed out if I was sitting around not doing anything, so. Um, so I did that, but I wrote a book um, called Here Comes Trouble. It's a, it's, a, it's a two dozen short stories from my life. I wrote them as short stories. They're constructed as short stories, but it's all nonfiction. So um, I did that, and uh, then I, I decided to start helping downtowns in Michigan by refurbishing their closed-up movie palaces. And so I've got the three that I run, or I'm part of, and then I... And then I have, um, uh, and then there's another half dozen in Michigan. And they revitalized the downtowns. It's like, it's in our downtown now that used to be 50% boarded up stores. The occupancy, the, uh, I mean, the occupancy rate is 100%. You, c you can't get a place in downtown. That's unheard of in Michigan. So a couple years ago, the Republican businessmen in town gave me their Man of the Year award. And because uh, <laughs> everybody's making money, I think. But, um, um, Do you have any cold pressed juice bars there? <laughs> no, I, and, and <laughs> 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 I 
Every time you say that, I keep thinking of the, the Woody Allen uh, in Annie Hall, where you <laughs> plate of mashed yeast. No, no, you like you keep you keep saying cold pressed Jews bar, <laughs> where where to Tony Roberts keeps saying Woody, <laughs> Woody Allen says, let's get some. Distinctly he heard you say Jews. He, 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 he said Jews. He didn't say juice. <laughs> and <laughs> no, it's like. <laughs> but yes, we do need more cold pressed Jews in Northern <laughs> Michigan. So please. Upper West Siders, come and join us. You will be welcomed. It's a wonderful, polite, kind area. <laughs> and there's your 140 character takeaway from this. Uh. Yeah, as opposed to the, the uterus thing the other day. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Yeah, we went <laughs> yes. Hi, Mr. Moore. Um, I have a question. I want to know what your opinion on new media uh, is and how uh, individuals can, uh, you know, without an already, uh, you know, wide following can uh, spread a message, especially with humor and things like that. Well, I'm, I'm a big supporter of it. I'm on, I'm on Twitter. I have almost 2 million followers on Twitter. I have almost 1.3 million very close Facebook friends. Um, <laughs> uh, like every baby boomer, I'm very nervous every time I hit send, hoping I don't send everything in my photo album. Um, so, <laughs> it's, uh, no, I think this is all great. It's a great way to communicate. I like, I like Twitter. I like because it forces you to edit. I love editing. I believe we can always say things with fewer words and, and it'd be better with fewer words. So, I like all of that. I think it's all, all good and a great way to reach people. We don't want to lose real journalism. We need that desperately. It can't all be gawker. Um, and, um, and I just read something that Jonathan Franzen uh, was writing, and so talking about and when he's writing a book in terms of how you've got to separate yourself from the noise. The reason nobody knew we were making this film is that we unplugged. And so, um, and by unplugging, nobody knew. And, the, and the, we, we were filming in all these countries and the media in this country didn't know. And, but we were the top story I'm in many countries because I'm not, I didn't have a wig on. I mean, I was out, it was me. And cameras would show up, and we'd be on the local news in Slovenia. But you know, because the networks have closed most of their bureaus, there are no foreign bureaus hardly anymore. So if they have a stringer there, he might see me on the Slovenian news, and he he calls up uh, the newspaper chain here and says he needs ten dollars an hour for a Slovenian translator because Michael Moore is here and something is going on. But they won't pay the ten dollars an hour for the translator. So we got through. We got through scot free because capitalism worked again in our favor um, by by ch you know choking journalism so the parent company can make more money. It guaranteed that we would have privacy uh, in making uh, this film. In the same way that GE, I'm allowed to be on NBC at, because we were the number one rated show in that time slot. So I made GE money. And that's their God, not Democrats or Republicans or any of that other stuff. They disagreed with everything I stood for. But as long as it made them money, that gave that was my protector. The capitalism, the, the big flaw of capitalism, uh, I think Lenin said that um, the capitalist will sell you the rope to hang himself with. I mean, that's, that's, been, that's been, I've been able to keep doing this because as long as the films and the TV shows make them money, when they don't make money anymore, or people stop going, then you won't hear from me. You know, well, you'll hear from me thanks to social media. That was their biggest mistake, is eliminating the filter, you know, that they can't. It's, I was thinking of Pauline Kael, you know, that she wrote this awful review of Roger Me and lied all the way through it about it, and that it wasn't 30,000 jobs that was lost, it was only 10,000. <laughs> <Yeah, it's like laughs> I, <coughs> I told her, I said, you'd make a great Holocaust denier. Wasn't well, it, it wasn't six million? It was only one million, you know. She, she panned Shoa. Huh? She panned Shoa. She panned Shoa. Yeah. Yeah, she did. Oh, I sure. I don't think I've twice now spoken ill of the dead in here, and this is not right. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm no, serious. Just, I'm, she, she I'm Shoah, nervous just, about yeah. that. Yeah. But but Pauline, I just want to give this example. She goes, it wasn't thirty thousand jobs lost. It was only ten thousand, and um, and um, I. I <laughs> I wrote a letter to the New Yorker, and I'm sorry, this kind of, sh again, shows my Midwesterness. I didn't, they didn't have letters to the editor at that time. It's very recent that they've had letters. I couldn't correct the record. I asked them to correct it. 
They wouldn't. They, they wouldn't. I asked if I could write a letter. They wouldn't publish it. So back then, shit could get said. People could be lied to. They can't do that anymore. You write that. You write that. I can. I can put up the statistics from the Bureau of Labor, and bring her down in an hour. That is power. The great Pauline Kale, and not just that thing that she said, but so many other things. To, be, to destroy her as a journalist in an hour with just the truth, with just the facts. That's what every kid now can do. And that's a great, great thing. That is a great thing. And that's why this, whatever the Pentagon had to do with inventing the internet, that's like one of the places our military dollars were well spent because it has eliminated the filter, it's eliminated the middleman, and now we can talk to each other. You can write me something afterwards and tell me something. Somebody couldn't get in and needed tickets. I just saw that on Twitter. Got them tickets. It was that easy. Didn't have to go through the Film Society. So I like that internet. Uh, hello, director. Um, I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from filmmaker. China. <laughs> yeah. That's mm. what it says on my on my 1040. It says filmmaker. Uh, I'm from China. I have a very good American friend. Um, I haven't watched your new film yet, but I'm really curious. Um, one day I have a debate with him. He said, I like you, but I don't like China. Because he think as an um, American, you, USA take responsibility for the world, like for ISIS thing. He said uh, once the, the thing bursts out, like American, they stand up and against it. But China, although they're um, saying th we are so rich and now we are developing and we're trying to be a big country, but you guys never say anything about this in, um, international issue that's saying you want to be strong, but you don't want to take responsible uh, responsibilities. So I'm really curious about this way of thinking and I love him a lot, but I just, don't know how to um, explain to him that why we are doing this, because I don't know. What's either. the issue you're talking about without being strong on? Uh, ISIS. 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 Oh, ISIS. Okay. Um, and that And that we're not being strong about it, or, he or think, China isn't? He think U.S. is very um, are taking responsibility for this issue, that they are standing up in the uh, United Nations says we are against it and we urge And China is not. China keeps silence toward this kind of issue like Middle East or you know like. Well but I think ISIS um, I mean I, ca I can't I don't have a good answer for you other than to say that to date ISIS has killed four Americans and where'd your plastic bottle go? Yeah it's under here. That killed four Americans in the last hour. So, I mean, we have so many other things that are killing us and people around the world. Not to diminish ISIS, but, you know, um, I don't know what the solution is to that problem. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the monster we created. And um, try to ask for forgiveness to the people in Iraq and the people in the Middle East. And when it sorts itself out, have a Marshall Plan and pay for everything they need uh, so that they can rebuild. I don't know what else... I don't know what else to do. We no more military, no more U.S. military. Uh, it's just you know the whole thing with Syria is a really crazy, scary mess right now with Russia and all that. But I think that we need to go to the timeout room, and um, we've not behaved properly and need to be, you know, we need to take some time out. There's so many hands. I will answer we like with one mic, so we need to. I will do. I will give 20 second answers so we can get this all in the last few minutes. 20 uh, second answers. 20 second answers. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Somebody time this. <laughs> <laughs> right, right down here. Right here. But there has to be a 20 second question though too. <laughs> I'm uh, Michael. My name is Leslie Harris. Hello. Oh, Leslie. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> Uh, I'm an indie filmmaker, and I just want to say, first of all, your film was wonderful, and I think what I got from it was that we're a much better country than we are now, and we can be better. And I think that that's a profound statement to make now, and I think people will um, leave the, hopefully leave the uh, theater 
thinking that they can make a change. Um, I wanted to say that, you know, as an independent filmmaker and talk to you as a director, um, you know, after I did my film, Just Another Girl in the IRT, and it was, a, and I want to say, like, for women filmmakers, I think people don't really understand how difficult it is and how challenging. I made my film in 93, which was a feature, <laughs> and it was distributed by Miramax and won an award at Sundance. And I've been trying to, I wrote a film called I Love Cinema, and it's a film about race, um, uh, police brutality, and uh, it's a satire and about the media. And it's been really difficult for 10 years to get this film made and to get people to really understand that women can also make satirical films. We can also make films that deal with politics and race and sex. And I would love for you to be in the film because I have a right wing pundit role and I also have a cop <laughs> role. But anyway, I just wanted to, um, I was happy in the film that you spoke about women. And I also was very, uh, happy that at the end of the Q&A yesterday, you talked about Hollywood and how we need to turn that on ourselves and look at Hollywood and how they treat women and people of color. And my question is, what do you think that, you know, people who are established in the, in the uh, Hollywood and who are mostly male and white, how, what they can do to, you know, help change what is wrong, I think, in the uh, Hollywood and how we can open doors for more people of color and women. Uh, first of all, did you just offer me a role in your film? <laughs> Is that true, really? Or are you just messing with me? It's true? Uh, I'll ac I accept. Oh, no. If you wrote it, I'll do it, yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not so <laughs> Let me, she didn't quite explain exactly who she is. Uh, uh, her film, Just Another Girl on the IRT, um, after almost 100 years of cinema, was the uh, first film distributed in theaters by an American movie studio, either major or the mini majors, in this case Miramax. Before Leslie's film, no film by an African American filmmaker, other than a couple of films, Daughters of the Dust, whatever, that were made for PBS, TV movies that got some theatrical. But tr a purely theatrical film, you were sitting with the first African-American woman to have a film released by a Hollywood studio in the United States. You are, you are part of cinema history, and, and uh, we met because I, had, I set up a foundation after Roger and me, and, and one of the things I wanted to fund were um, films by uh, African-American women, that because there had been none, not a single one, this is 93, so 95 is the 100 year mark of cinema, right? Not a single one in 98 years, African American women make up about 7% of the population, that's 7% of the population that have had no voice in Hollywood for the entire history of cinema. We should all feel, as, as people part of the industry, a certain sense of shame about that. So I, I wrote a check also uh, for this, uh, to be supportive of it, and I've done that for other filmmakers. And, um, and I said on the stage, as she referenced yesterday, that the top Hollywood films of all, I mean, the Hollywood movies of the last seven years, the New York Times, I don't know if you saw this a couple months ago, 1.9% of them were directed by women. Not black women, <laughs> women. One point nine percent it's amazing really that women are so nice <laughs> and <laughs> it's like or that e any of us have throats left that they haven't just been ripped out from I mean seriously we're lucky that you know I feel the same way about the younger generation we all went to college for nearly free I mean those of us who went to a public university you know it was free right if you went to Berkeley what'd you pay if you're my age zero Went to SUNY, zero. City College, zero, right? And we've raised a generation of kids where we've now got, you give them 30, 40, $100,000 worth of student debt, and they're not mad at us. We hated our parents for a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> they're not mad at us. I can't believe it. We raised them to be too nice. But, but seriously, they need to revolt. They need to revolt against us. We created this horrible system for them. And women, w those of us, especially men, need to say this and say it over and over and then do something about it. My guild, Writers Guild, Directors Guild, we have to fix this. This is absolutely wrong. 
this is the most liberal of all industries when you use the word industry in this country and for it to be so shamelessly white and male. But, and, and let me just say this, I'm not saying that because I'm a liberal making a, a politically correct statement. I'm saying it as a film goer, as an audience member, I'm missing out on her story, their stories, that person's. I, when you block out whole groups of people from the cinema, what are the great films that you and I are missing right now because their voices can't be heard? I want to go to that movie. I want to hear that voice. I'm being denied that voice by a system that's set up to, to give the reins to white men. And I'm telling you, like I said the other day, anthropologists are not going to look kindly on us. We are going to look like Neanderthals. And they're going to say, and even the liberal ones, <laughs> the liberal ones let 1.9% of the majority gender make movies. It's a form of apartheid, folks, right? When the minority <laughs> controls everything and the majority gets a bone thrown to them, that's just absolutely wrong. So anyways, that was more than 20 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. I'm gonna be in, I'm gonna be in a movie. <laughs> I'll try to make it quick. Um, you had mentioned in the past how the camera is a weapon. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that for narrative film in comparison with documentary film. Same, exactly the same. And so do you see any differences in how it can be used in, in no. any specifics about that? Okay, great, thank you. No, it's all storytelling. No, it's all storytelling. And you can write nonfiction or you can write fiction. And, and we both know the examples of the ones that are just amazing, right? And, um, and so, and I'm just, I feel bad that documentary filmmakers have put themselves over at the children's table at the Thanksgiving dinner for so many years because in the other arts, you know, pick up the Times book review section a day, there's three times as many reviews of nonfiction books than there are fiction books. Fiction, nonfiction is not the bastard stepchild in, in books. Uh, on television, depending on what week, 10 of your top 20 shows are going to be nonfiction shows of the top 20 most watched shows. Americans love nonfiction. Some of those shows suck like, you know, So You Want to Dance with the Stars or whatever it's <laughs> called. And some of them are 60 Minutes. Americans love nonfiction. And, and th there should be, we should have huge audiences going to nonfiction cinema. And if I, that's also on my plate to figure out how to fix that. But documentary filmmakers have to participate in, in fixing that. To what I know I started talking about Bernard and Barker talking about how what 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 dis now I remember what destroyed then the nonfiction cinema as we entered this decade is that the audience went one too many times to the movie theater to and saw a TV doc and said I don't need to spend twelve dollars systematic movie making yeah. right yeah. Yeah. just like if you went to, if you went to the Lincoln Plaza and saw a Lifetime movie you know mm -hmm. you know the difference right there's no rule book but you know the difference your nose knows the difference. And uh, too many TV documentaries have been in movie theaters, and, and they've they kind of destroyed the movie-going audience that said we could just wait and watch this at home. So other good documentaries that are theatrical documentaries haven't had the audience that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Funniest documentary I've seen in years, Meet the Patels. Seriously, go see this movie. I think it's still playing here in New York. It's, it's really funny and sweet and, and made as a theatrical movie. Uh, I was wait for the mic. Powerful voice. Uh, I was wondering if you were planning on revisiting the whole gun problem in America, especially considering how rampant it's been the past few years. Because I think Bowling for Columbine is amazing work. Thank you. No, I never will. Uh, I will never do that again. Why? Yeah. Why? Nothing has changed. Play Bowling for Columbine tonight. It's like I made it last week. You said you had said to Larry King, "I'm never going." I to told Larry. Again. There, I was on Larry King after Sandy Hook in Newtown, and I said. Uh, at the end of the show, I, said, I just want to say one thing to you, Larry. Don't ever call me again. I am not appearing on another single TV or radio show. When these killings happen, you guys always call me because of Bowling for Columbine. I am not going to do this anymore because it just implies it's now the new normal. I'm not part of the new normal. Don't call me. You don't hear any. You don't see any quotes from me. I may say something on my own Twitter or whatever about it when things happen. Um, I'll remind you that there have been 294 mass shootings in the U.S. this year alone. Mass, definition of mass, four or more people four. shot by one killer. 294 of them, you don't bother to, they don't bother to report it every day now because it is 
just like a branch fell and hit a, hit a car. And that's not the America I want to live in. So everything I've had to say, I said in that film. Hi, thank you, um, Michael. I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, okay, uh, 20 seconds or less. Here I go. <laughs> I'm going to try. Um, I was raised by hippie activism parents on a university campus in Canada. And um, when I was in it diapers. It doesn't get better than that, folks. <laughs> 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 um, you know, we were we were marching. I was marching in diapers on no nuke, nukes rallies and things like that. And so, you know, activism is very important to me. And with your films, you give your voice, and it's amazing work. And this might be too much of a question for you, but um, touching on what the first question person asked in talking about sort of armchair activism, um, I I'm at a loss of how to be active. Now, just as a person that doesn't make movies, I don't know what I can do anymore. And I find social media, um, when, I, when I try and offer solution-based ideas into conversations, it seems to me that people are more interested in arguing um, than, than coming up with ideas. So I don't know, this may be too much of a question, but I'm just curious what you think the common person can do. Very quickly, uh, call the Thank teachers you. union, uh, look up the name of the principals that are fighting the standardized tests in New York City, stop the standardized tests uh, from being given the students, it'll improve the school district once we stop teaching to that test. If you have uh, students in public schools, organize with the other parents to get better food at lunch, they're, they're putting poison in your kids. Um, uh, constantly talk to people about uh, this industrial, this prison industrial complex that we have. Just talk to people. Talk to people at work. Talk to people in your family. Talk to people in the neighborhood. Talk, talk, talk about these issues. You know, you go into a pub in, in Ireland. You, you go into a bar in France. It's nothing but political discussions. I don't, I've never had a political discussion in a bar in this country. Um, and a ask any foreigner who's in the audience, right, how different it is to go to a pub here than to go to a pub someplace else where they will argue politics uh, deep into the night. And that we don't do. So start doing it. We just, some of us just have to start doing it. The only reason we have the gay, the, the gay marriage thing went away is because gay people came out of the closet. More and more came out over the last 10 years to their parents, to their friends, their coworkers, their neighbors. And what, guess what? No horns, no tail. You know, nobody threatened. Why, I love that person. I actually love this person. Oh my God, you can't love the person. You're not allowed to be married to the person you love. That's just inherently in unfair. You don't have to be a Democrat or Republican or anything to say that. So that changed because gay people made it change. Gay people didn't give up once it was made the law of the land in, in all those states. They kept going. But it was an individual thing. It wasn't necessarily a big movement. But individually, everybody just kept coming out. And then the hate started to sift away once they were public. So I mean, there's always, just start thinking of little things that you can do. Um, and, and somebody, I get, you know, make a film about this, or you, know, you, the, you have these cameras now. <laughs> Everybody's got a camera. I saw this film, uh, Tangerine. Um, you know, I was amazed that. Uh, 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 it's a shot with an iPhone. Shot with an iPhone. Slightly souped up. Yep. yep. And 10 minutes into it, you've forgotten about the gimmick of the iPhone, and it's like a good story. It's a movie. It's a movie. <laughs> yeah. And a good one. Yeah. Yep. So make a movie. Don't say you can or you don't know how or whatever. I, I come from Flint, Michigan. I had a, a, a high school education. I didn't, you know, I mean, I just did it. I didn't know anything, you know, but I didn't. That, so don't let whatever you don't have stop you and don't worry about looking foolish or having an Upper West Sider laugh at you because you're acting <laughs> foolish. You know, just do it. And also, don't worry about being polite. And don't worry about being, yeah, because you're a good person. You are polite, but sometimes you can't be polite to the, the thing that's crushing your neck. You know, you have to you have to stand up and say, it. I mean, this is what this is like. You know, the Black Lives Matter. They like the, they try to get these Democrats. Can you just say it? Just say it. Say it and sound like you mean it. That Black Lives Matter. You know, and so they say. They, so what does Hillary say? Hillary goes, Well, yes, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter. White Lives Matter. All lives matter. <laughs> no, no. No white man has the boot of seven cops on his skull in Staten Island being killed. Stop it. You have to say the truth. Bernie Sanders, Bernie, will you say it? And he, 
I love Colbert's description of Bernie. He's, he looks like he's like the guy that always in the airport that just missed his plane. <laughs> it's always like, so Bernie finally Bernie's frustrated. You know they've come up on the stage right now, and he goes, "I'll try to do my best impersonation of him." Black lives, of course they matter. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> of course they matter. <laughs> no, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's okay. You can just say it. You know, it's it's it's. <laughs> things are changing. The young people are changing it. They don't have a problem saying it, and the and the 16 to 35 year olds are are gonna are turning this thing around right now because there's so much less haters amongst the kids that we've raised, and that's the one good thing that our generation did. We have not raised haters, and so it will be better in the in the coming years. Michael, thank you. I know. I'm sorry. I'm talking. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.